For patients with recurrent or metastatic squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, we really should think about that same first question. Is the patient in front of me curable? Uh, unfortunately, for patients with recurrent disease, the answer will usually be no. But there's about 10 to 15 percent, maybe 20 percent of patients who we can salvage with either surgery or re-irradiation. And at the very least, we need to have a discussion with the patient uh, about that. But let's talk about the larger group of patients who unfortunately are not going to be uh, curable in the recurrent or metastatic setting, and how do we approach those? Then we take into account things like, uh, obviously, patient preferences, uh, their performance status, uh, their ability to tolerate uh, different chemotherapy agents. Um, with all things being equal, for the most part, we usually start with either a doublet or a triplet chemotherapy regimen that is uh, platinum-containing. Uh, so carboplatin, paclitaxel, cisplatin, docetaxel, regimens like that. Of course, the extreme regimen that incorporates cetuximab is approved for first-line recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer. This is a regimen that improved survival from seven and a half months to 10 months, incorporating uh, platinum, 5-FU, and cetuximab, with cetuximab extended as maintenance after the uh, six cycles of uh, the triplet combination. When patients have progressive disease after first-line therapy, often will use a single-agent uh, therapy based on what they have not had in the first-line setting or in the initial curative setting. And uh, single agents that have activity in head and neck cancer include the taxanes, the platinums, the fluoropyrimidines, 5-FU and capecitabine, uh, cetuximab, uh, of course, and, and methotrexate. And those are all agents with low-level activity, but, but real activity that can offer uh, a benefit to patients. Fortunately, we're seeing emerging data about immunotherapy in recurrent metastatic head and neck cancer, and it looks like those agents will be a large part of our armamentarium, and in fact, uh, it looks like they may be even more effective than uh, what we currently have. This balance between the desire to cure the patient and the need to preserve quality of life for the long term is something that we've always struggled with in head and neck cancer. Let's remember that for the head and neck cancer patient, not only does the disease but also the treatment profoundly affect really how we define ourselves as human beings. It affects the way we interact with each other, it, it affects our speech, it affects our swallowing. So we know from studies that head and neck cancer has the most profound effect on quality of life of any malignancy. Um, and uh, the most profound effect on social interaction of any malignancy, and among the most um, a dramatic effect on uh, financial uh, outcome and, and, and financial health, if you will, in the long term. So these are all issues that we need to keep in mind when approaching a patient. When we ask patients what do they want out of therapy, uh, in almost every study that's been done, the answer has been cure. And, and of course, uh, that makes sense, and, and that's what we always uh, try to think about and is paramount in, in our minds. How do we cure this patient? But we realize that we can cure the patient um, with uh, modifications in the therapy that will also hopefully preserve their quality of life in the long term. So what we've gotten away from in the last uh, couple of decades is, uh, are really um, very extensive surgeries, uh, for instance, uh, laryngectomies or, or um, glossectomies, total glossectomies, with the realization that we can take non-surgical approaches to patients who would have otherwise needed those surgeries and preserve their organs, preserve their function. Now there's a big push to stratify patients uh, into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk with the thought that we can de-intensify therapy for the low-risk patients and preserve those cure rates. That's not part of standard management yet. We're beginning to see more and more data, prospective data, on de-intensification approaches, approaches that, for instance, lower the radiation therapy dose, change the radiation therapy volume, or modify the systemic therapy, all in an effort to de-intensify therapy and preserve cure rates. If I had to guess, those will be part of standard therapy probably in the next few years, certainly within the next five years, but we don't have enough data to change standard management yet.
For HPV positive patients, we now realize quite clearly that their prognosis is much better and that for many patients with HPV positive disease, we are likely over-treating. We don't need to be as aggressive as we are when we're looking at cure rates of approaching 90%. And so with that in mind, we began to hypothesize whether we could reduce the intensity of therapy, de-intensify, and maintain the cure rates. And when we think about how to do that and, and what the most um, morbid parts of our therapy are, we begin to think about things like reducing the radiation dose or modifying the radiation volume or integrating minimally invasive surgery for these patients who often have small tumors but more extensive neck disease in an effort to try to, again, reduce uh, some of the other modalities. So some of the efforts that have been uh, aimed at doing that have included minimally invasive surgery, so transoral robotic surgery, for instance, um, or, uh, as I said, modifications of the radiation. We saw some very interesting data uh, recently, um, one from uh, ECOG, uh, another from a, a group at uh, University of North Carolina with the University of Florida that essentially reduced the dose of radiation and at least the prospective outcomes for these patients appear to be maintained, outcomes in terms of cure rates. At the University of Chicago, we undertook a slightly different approach. Uh, and what we uh, hypothesized was that these cancers would require the same dose of radiation to kill a cancer cell, but that we may be able to spare the other parts of the neck, uh, specifically PTV2, the microscopic, um, the, disease, the parts of the neck that are at risk for microscopic disease, but we don't see any disease at this point. And, and we hypothesized that we could actually eliminate radiation to those areas and improve quality of life in the long run. And we were just able to present our data now with significant follow-up showing that that, in fact, appears to be the case. We're able to maintain local regional control, maintain progression-free survival and overall survival in these patients, spare the PTV2, the, high, the microscopic areas, and actually end up with much lower G-tube rates and better quality of life uh, a, a year after therapy. So uh, the treatment options for uh, uh, locally advanced head and neck cancer uh, usually entail two of the three modalities. F for stage three and four head and neck cancers, we're likely to use surgery as long as it's not going to be debilitating and disfiguring, uh, followed by uh, radiotherapy alone. Uh, radiation in the post-operative setting is a bit lower dose than the radiation in the locally advanced setting. Another option for certain cancers, particularly, particularly those in the voice box or the oropharynx, is a non-surgical approach. We don't usually use chemo and radiation primarily for the mouth, for the oral cavity. That's in part because it's extremely difficult for the patient to have the whole mouth radiated. There is a chance that the jawbone and other bony structures can have osteonecrosis and die and get infected. Uh, the dry mouth uh, and uh, caries and so on, the xerostomia uh, associated with it, uh, with radiating the mouth, uh, tend to lead us away from that approach. So we tend to have a surgical approach for the oral cavity. Uh, the oropharynx and the, and the larynx have both options, and we choose surgery if it can be done functionally uh, up front, uh, or if, if not, then we would prefer radiation with chemotherapy. Um, Transoral robotic surgery or transoral laser surgery uh, is a common way to access the oropharynx and the larynx. And so uh, just because it's at the far back in the throat doesn't mean that we don't have surgical options. And technology over the past 10 or 15 years has enabled the surgeons to have operating uh, instruments down at the end of a dark hole with lighted binocular instruments. Uh, the surgical robot, the first, was FDA approved uh, in 2009. There's now another uh, uh, technology or, or robot-assisted device that was approved uh, uh, in the summer of 2015. So we have lots of surgical technologies that we can apply for a functional removal of locally advanced head and neck cancers. <clears throat> Nonetheless, those patients are likely to get post-operative radiation therapy. Uh, 
And if there are worrisome prognostic factors, such as multiple lymph nodes or positive margins uh, or extranodal extension, then we would add usually chemotherapy on top in the postoperative setting. Uh, if it's a, a morbid functional surgical procedure, then we would prefer to use chemo and radiation or cetuximab and radiation. Cetuximab was FDA approved uh, in 2006 uh, in the uh, so-called Bonner trial where the addition of cetuximab to radiotherapy had a, an absolute 10% survival benefit. This held up in the five-year uh, analysis uh, and report. And so this uh, was quite promising because in patients who are uh, chemotherapy intolerant, as I mentioned, up to 30%, now have a curative option that can enhance the effect of radiotherapy. Uh, in, in addition, we have really these two standards of care uh, and so I mentioned the, the fact that HPV-positive patients are comprising a, an in increasing subset of head and neck cancers. And so uh, the question arises, um, do HPV-positive patients do just as well with cetuximab as they do with cisplatin, the other chemotherapy that's a standard regimen? <clears throat> and it appears that they do. There's, there has been a head-to-head -head clinical trial performed. It's completed accrual. It is not yet reported out, so we're left with independent studies and looking at the uh, so-called hazard ratio or the benefit, the statistical benefit of adding cetuximab to radiation versus uh, comparing it to cisplatin chemoradiation. It appears that the survival uh, benefit is the same uh, or roughly equivalent by adding cetuximab to radiation as adding cisplatin chemotherapy to radiation. <clears throat> Now, um, the issue of HPV status, because these patients uh, are uh, lower risk for recurrence versus HPV negative patients that are higher risk for recurrence, uh, we feel like we should intensify therapy for patients who have higher risk disease. I also mentioned that HPV positive patients are not always low, low risk. There is an intermediate group that has the bulky nodal disease, that has uh, a T4, that has smokers, heavy smokers. Uh, and so clinical trials right now are testing whether we should alter the dose for higher risk, intermediate risk, and lower risk. Clearly those subgroups exist based on prognostic factors, but we want to make sure that we select the appropriate treatment that's just enough to cure the disease without causing uh, morbidity and functional impairments that will persist for the life of that patient.